Hello everyone, this is Historian Splaining, a historian tells you why everything you know is wrong. And these lectures are on SoundCloud, iTunes, Stitcher, and other platforms. And if by any chance you can help keep them coming, please go to my Patreon page. The link should be in the description. So I want to talk now about the history of Central Asia which is something that I've thought about for a long time, and a couple of listeners have mentioned it, and something that I've been aware of in the course of my studies. If you work on Europe, India, or China, Central Asia is kind of always out there, just you know, beyond the frontier, just beyond the periphery. And sometimes these peoples from the Central Asian steppes just suddenly show up and take over, you know, they're all of a sudden there are Mongols overrunning your country or, or Turks or Jurchens or whoever. And you kind of have to shrug and say, what's that about? <laughs> where, did, where did that come from? And so it's something that I think is very important for people in all sorts of different fields and different parts of the world to understand, but that we rarely do talk about on its own as a subject worthy of study on its own merit. And it's a meeting place, an important crossroads of different influences of knowledge, traditions, practices, goods from Russia and China, India, uh, Persia, and the Islamic world. In a lot of ways, you can say it's kind of the center of the civilized world. It's where all these things come together and, and interact. Uh, And yet, it's probably discussed the least. You might have heard of it tangentially through, like I mentioned, the Mongols or the Silk Road, of course, which is this trade network that ran mainly through Central Asia. Uh, It also is the place that transmitted all kinds of important technologies like gunpowder and printing, uh, art, different religions. Uh, It was important in the rise of monotheism all the way from the ancient world to the roots of the first monotheistic religions and all the way up to the nuclear age and the Soviet and post-Soviet worlds. So it's been really central through all these different kind of stages of the history of civilization, and yet it's probably the least known, especially to people in the West. It's kind of the most unknown, and I think a great illustration of that is Borat. You know, you you may have seen the, the movies and the TV show around this fictitious character who's sort of intentionally ridiculous, who's a sort of satire of people's perception of foreigners, and he's supposed to be from Kazakhstan. And the sort of fictional Kazakhstan that is alluded to in the movie has basically nothing to do with the real place. And the scenes filmed uh, that were supposed to be there were actually in Romania, and the music was really Romanian, right? It was Eastern European, not Central Asian at all. And I think that that illustrates how these countries in Central Asia can kind of be used almost as a stand-in for like the unknown foreign, right? The foreign places that Westerners know the least about and on which they can just kind of project whatever associations they want with foreign people. So I want to explain some about how society has worked and how it's developed in Central Asia, right? But you know, I found, not surprisingly, that this was very daunting because when you look at it, Central Asia is incredibly complicated. You know, it's very different from talking about a rooted urban civilization that has had long-standing centers of power like Western Europe or China or even Mesoamerica. Uh, It's a place where still today most people are mobile, where there are very few defensible positions, and hence it's extremely unstable and unpredictable. And there have been sort of constant shifts and movements of power and overthrows, and and it's very hard to generalize about the way you can when you talk about, say, you know, Sweden or or West Africa. Uh, On the one hand, there are certain continuities, there are certain very persistent patterns that you can see. 
you know, beliefs, rituals that are still practiced, that may have some roots thousands of years ago and might still be recognizable to people who lived thousands of years ago. And yet, in terms of who exercises power and to what ends, there's been a kind of a hundred revolutions, right? And you really, it's hard to make kind of mid-level narratives out of lives in Central Asia. It's incredibly tumultuous. So as I expected would probably be the case, I'll have to do this in two parts. So I think this will just be the first part. And I'll start from prehistory and conclude probably with the Mongols, right? With Genghis Khan and the Mongol Empire, which all of you have probably heard of. But to understand this history, you have to start with the geography, right? As I said, Central Asia is probably the biggest zone of mostly flat land in the world, excluding, you know, maybe the Sahara Desert, which is, you know, barely habitable, right? So Central Asia is overwhelmingly flat. It's really right in the middle of Eurasia. It's kind of a misnomer to call it Central Asia. It's really the the core of Eurasia. So it's the the middle part of the biggest landmass in the world. And it's the largest region in the world that is totally surrounded by land and does not touch any ocean and is really not anywhere near any open ocean, right? So communication, transport is totally over land. And yet, in a way, because it's so flat and because it's mostly grassy and it's dominated by these very expansive, flat, scrubby grasslands called steppes, uh, it's, in a way, you could say a kind of ocean in itself. It's so easy to traverse quickly, especially on horseback. People can move fast. They can attack fast. And they can sustain their lives in, on a very large scale without settled agriculture, but instead depending on mobile living animals, including not only horses, but cattle, sheep, goats, and so on. So in a way, people can move around it and communicate and intermingle much as they do on oceans when they have mastered sailing. Right. So that's part of why I'm calling Central Asia sort of the ocean of land. Uh, and and in addition to that, it serves as this crossroads and this place of intermingling, a lot like the shores of certain oceans do. And historians today will talk about the Atlantic world and how all these societies and colonies were so interconnected and people were moving and exchanging knowledge and goods in the Caribbean and and Western Europe and West Africa, or they'll talk about the Indian Ocean Basin. Well, I think you can talk about Central Asia in the same kind of way, that there's this sort of greater sphere of the entire interior of Eurasia that was all kind of drawn in to this web of movement and exchange across the steppes. So to be a little more precise, Central Asia basically is this agglomeration of steppes as well as desert and some mountains, not very much, but a few mountain ranges, that stretches basically from the Caspian Sea in the west over to China and Manchuria in the east. And it's centered, as I said, on this kind of belt of steps that act as like a highway connecting east and west. And north of it, you have the Siberian forests, and south of it, the Himalayan mountains. And basically, the sort of core zone that anybody today would include under this heading of Central Asia comprises the five stands, okay, these five former Soviet nations right in the middle of Eurasia, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, and Kyrgyzstan. And beyond that core area, you can also include further sort of similar zones. So some people would include Afghanistan to the south. You also can include some of Siberia and European Russia that has steppes running around the Black Sea and down to the Caucasus. So that can also be considered sort of part of Central Asia more broadly. 
And to the east, most would also include the province today called Xinjiang, which is Chinese territory. And uh, it's, traditionally, it was also called East Turkestan, right? So it's, it's like those so former Soviet stands I was talking about. It has similar language and customs. Uh, but today, it's part of China, and it's called Xinjiang, meaning the Western province, right? Because it's West from the point of view of China. And also, most would include Mongolia and Inner Mongolia, which is also part of China. And at the farthest extreme, some would also throw in Manchuria, right? But, but basically, the main core zone of what we would definitely consider Central Asia includes those five stands, Xinjiang and Mongolia. Okay, so this region, in terms of its peoples, its inhabitants, it's multi-layered and multi-ethnic, Right? There are many different peoples, and I'll probably mention some, you know, the Iranians and Jews and Slavs. Uh, but the biggest sort of broad umbrella groups are Turkic and Mongolic, right? And you can even lump those together into a sort of broad category of Turco-Mongolic peoples who tend to speak fairly similar languages and that have a lot of exchange and a lot of familiarity with one another. And a lot of overlap and intermixing, right, through migration and, and trade and contact, right? So you can see this sort of broadly similar, somewhat consistent Turco-Mongolic group, right? And for a long time, people thought that the languages of Turkic and Mongolic peoples all came from a common root and that they could all be called Altaic languages, and that they had come from some sort of common ancestor maybe in Siberia or uh, a part of Siberia near Mongolia. Uh, that theory has since been criticized and basically rejected. Most scholars don't believe that anymore, that there's a sort of single ancestor people of all these Altaic Turks and Mongols, but that actually they come from various sources around Eurasia and that their languages have grown more similar over time through interaction, which is a very interesting and unusual phenomenon. You know, we don't see German and Finnish becoming more similar, at least not until very recent times, right? We don't see uh, Spanish and Greek getting more similar, but that seems to have happened in Central Asia because the interaction is so intense. Again, because people are so unsettled, so mobile, and there's so much movement and mixing. The society of these Turkic and Mongolic peoples is based overwhelmingly on animal herding, right? The, there are some places where you can farm and grow crops in Central Asia. There are oases, there are some river valleys where that is done. But for the most part, the steppes are too dry to really be able to grow much. And the, the soil, the terrain isn't good, but it is good enough to move animals across and graze animals. And so it's far more efficient and effective to make your living and survive off of herding animals. So as I said before, on the steppes and in the deserts, there are very few defensible positions. And instead, because the land is flat and because it's easy to raise animals like horses, there is really a tremendous attacker's advantage. And because of this, you can see new empires very rapidly rising and falling all through the history of Central Asia. There's really a kind of kaleidoscopic shifting of power, right? As people will confederate, ally together, use their attacker's advantage to take territory, seize cities and trade routes, and then just as quickly either dissolve or be attacked and overthrown by someone else, right? And if we, if we look at the history and read the history of Central Asia, especially the traditional histories that were written like in the 1920s and 30s, it can be extremely confusing as these new powers suddenly show up. Wait, now it's Seljuk Turks. Now there are Khitans. Now there are Kyrgyz. Like, who are all these people? Where are they coming from? What's going on? And that can be a bit deceptive because more often than not, these new states or tribes or ethnic groups that come to power and suddenly appear on the map, they're really just kind of loose alliances or confederations of 
small nomadic groups, right, that can join together, you know, like fingers coming together on a fist and suddenly becoming a power on the scene, but then going away again. And if we extend this metaphor that I was using before of an ocean, you know, imagine looking at Central Asia uh, from far above and seeing people or small bands, groups, clans moving around on the steps uh, and compare them to, say, seeing fish moving around in a lake or an ocean. Uh, when a new group appears on the scene, it's sort of like when fish, if you imagine fish coming together and forming a school and then moving together, moving in unison, uh, choosing a direction, right? But then just as quickly when a threat shows up or the current changes uh, just dissolving, right, and kind of melting away back into the landscape. That seems to be what has happened over and over again in Central Asia, right? And often these very powerful peoples like Turks or Mongols are actually sort of, um, can come out of just a small band that manages to gather just enough followers to create a critical mass. And then when things aren't going well, just breaks up again. Right. So these peoples, these states, these empires, these kingdoms keep appearing on the historical record and then seeming to vanish again. Right. But it's only the political formation that vanished. It's not usually the people themselves that disappeared. Right. So this is an extremely complex history. And I'm going to try. I've sort of made a rough periodization here that I hope can clarify you know, what, what has happened and how, how Central Asia got to the point where it was in the Mongol Golden Age. And then I'll probably do a part two and talk about uh, the, the journey into the modern world, right? Okay, so if we go back to the prehistory, it seems that the first inhabitants of Central Asia were, you know, migratory hunter-gatherers who moved into the steppes from various different directions, right? Probably from east and west and south. And they, you know, followed animals, they gathered uh, grains and fruits, and we don't know much ab about who they were, right? It seems that they probably were various different groups and tribes who spoke different languages, who came from different parts of Eurasia. A lot of them we just can't identify, but there's a good chance that some of them were Dravidian, meaning they were from uh, the, the same large ethnic group in India that created the Indus Valley civilization in what's now Pakistan, and that still exists in southern India. So people who speak languages like Tamil, those are Dravidian languages in the southern end of India. So most likely a lot of these early uh, prehistoric people were, were Dravidian, but a lot of them were other groups we just don't know, right? Some of them then gradually started to adopt agriculture, and farming did begin, especially around uh, river valleys and inland deltas. And it seems that a few large towns did develop, maybe even as early as 6000 BC, sizable towns with food production based on irrigation. Right, uh, which was really necessary to make fields productive in such a dry area. Okay, now this it seems preceded by maybe a few centuries or so. It preceded the creation of domesticated animal herds. Okay, so animal herding started probably around 5000 BC and it began with sheep and goats, right, which were among the earliest domesticated animals in most parts of the world. And then not long after that, maybe around 4700 or 4800 BC, horses were domesticated. And this was really pivotal. This began a, it catalyzed a big change in how people lived in the steppes. So the horses were domesticated probably first for food, you know, the same as sheep and cattle. Uh, then they also began to be exploited for other uses, their hides, uh, their hair, which can be stronger and more abundant than other animals. 
and then as beasts of burden, right? Especially pulling carts and sledges. Then horseback riding was invented probably by around 3700 BC. Okay, and so with horseback riding, you don't need any other equipment other than just your own body and the horse. And critically, it can be used to manage large herds. So this multiplied the number of sheep or goats or cattle that you could move around with you as, as a small family or a clan or a tribe when you could have uh, shepherds and herders on horseback. So after not very long, these farmers and also hunter-gatherers shifted into dependence overwhelmingly on animals, right? They abandoned the practice of farming and irrigation in settled sites, at least many of them did, and instead became nomadic pastoralists who kept their animals fed by moving them, especially moving them seasonally between different sites and up to higher elevations in summer and lower elevations in winter, right? So it seems that a small household, you know, of about five people, that seems to be the kind of bedrock basic social unit right from prehistoric times up to today in much of Central Asia. And a household of about five can be supported by a herd of about 100 animals, right? So we're talking about a society where there's, you know, 20 or so times as many non-human animals as there are humans, and that is what supplies enough food and enough goods for people to survive. Society, it seems, began to be loosely organized into clans and into larger groupings of clans that we can roughly call tribes. And these clans and tribes did have hierarchies, right? There were people of uh, there were there were particularly clans of higher status than others, and there were leaders, uh, mostly men, who were kind of chieftains and who could expect service and tribute from their subordinates. But these leaders were relatively weak, right? They didn't have the kind of power. There wasn't the sort of powerful kingship that you might see in a settled city. Uh, many women also, it seems, were powerful leaders. Uh, this is often true in very martial and warlike societies. You know, you can compare it to like Sparta or, or the Iroquois Confederacy. Um, often when men are engaged in a lot of fighting and are moving around, then women will sort of manage society. And it seems that this often happened in Central Asia and, and has continued to happen. Power and status in this society was caught up very much in the number of fighting men that you could muster and who would fight for you, and also in animals. So most often, if you could, you would base your lifestyle on herding and nomadism. And it seems in hard times, people, when, when their animal herds were not producing, they would become settled farmers as a way to sort of get a basic staple diet and feed themselves. They would go somewhere where it was possible to farm and settle down. But this has, it seems, has always been considered a step down in status and a great loss of prestige to give up uh, your herds of animals. Uh, so, you know, there you can see it as almost a kind of reversal of status, right? Whereas the Greeks in their cities would look at themselves as highly civilized and cultivated and would look down on nomadic barbarians. It seems in Central Asia there was more status and prestige in being a herding nomad. At this early stage, if we talk about these prehistoric years, uh, we know very little of the gods or priests of the Central Asian peoples, but it seems that there was a lot of animal sacrifice. We can tell that from the archaeology, that animal sacrifice uh, was was very important, and a lot of resources were put into it, and there may have been gods, deities associated with animals. So this was the situation we can see forming by about 3500 BC, right, where this transition to the nomadic lifestyle is well underway. And it seems that uh, a new group of people showed up in Central Asia and moved in and invaded very quickly around 3500 to 3000 BC, taking advantage of this new nomadic way of life. And 
these people were Indo-European. Okay, so that's a group that uh, I've mentioned before. They probably called themselves Arya or Arya. And they originated, it seems, in the steppe lands around the Black Sea and the Caucasus, right? So in that area that's now kind of southern Russia and Ukraine. And they started to spread out very quickly and invade in all directions out of that original homeland. Some went westward into Europe and became the ancestors of Germans and Slavs and Latins and all those people. And also some went eastward into Central Asia. And this branch we call Indo-Aryan or Indo-Iranian. So they're the uh, progenitors of modern day Indian and Iranian people, right? But a lot of them also went into the steppes into Central Asia. So this Indo-Iranian group adopted and improved upon the steppe nomadic lifestyle of the people who are already there. And they were even more warlike, okay? It seems that they created war chariots by around 2000 BC. Uh, and by 1500 BC, they had become known in much of the, the, um, in much of the continent. They'd become known as formidable guerrilla fighters who took advantage of horses to be able to attack quickly, make surprise attacks, um, shock and overwhelm their opponents, and quickly retreat. Okay, so this made it possible for them to, to overwhelm and defeat both other nomadic opponents and people in settled farms and villages. Right? Over time, these sort of uh, raiding and guerrilla bands evolved into more disciplined military forces under stronger leaders. And a, another important technological development not long after this was the creation of small compound bows and arrows that can be fired from horseback, right? So instead of having to decide, well, am I going to ride on horseback and swing a sword or an axe, or am I going to ride in a chariot and fire bows and arrows, now they had small, powerful bows that they could fire while riding on horseback in all directions and even... Uh, learned to fire directly backwards so that they could retreat from uh, an engagement that they were losing and fire at back at their opponents as they were pursued. And this made them practically unbeatable and indestructible as kind of lightning attack forces. They also developed games and sports on horseback to use as training for warfare. Uh, the game of polo, which is known, you know, around the world today. Uh, it seems originated in Persia, so south of Central Asia. But then similar versions and variations on polo were quickly adopted and spread through Central Asia. And there's a sort of variation on polo that w seems to have originated, you know, back hundreds of years BC, but is still played where the ball that you're trying to move back and forth is a, a dead goat. Right. And so this is, again, an illustration of how centrally important animals were and almost everything that people used and exploited and depended on came from the bodies of, of animals. These nomadic peoples apparently also made more important uh, inventions and contributions that are more familiar uh, to us today. This was probably the time when the first stringed instruments were invented. They probably also invented trousers, right? You know, pa pants with two legs, as we would call them in America, right? You kind of need that if you're going to be riding around on horseback. So to be more specific, you know, what do we know about these Indo-Iranian peoples and their languages, their life ways, and the groups that they formed? Well, the biggest confederated group seems to have been the Scythians, Okay, and this is a group that also made their way westward into Europe, and there are writings about them from uh, Greece. Also, there were Bactrians, Sogdians, and others, right? And some of them, like the Bactrians and the Sogdians, actually kind of dominated particular areas, particular zones of the steppe lands, and are still sometimes called by those names, Bactria and Sogdia. So the, the peoples, especially the Scythians, though, were described, they did not have writing, right? They did not use writing, but there were civilizations that knew of them and interacted with them that did write about them, both to the west and the east. So there were Greeks like Herodotus, 
who wrote about the Scythians and Chinese scholars that did as well. And it seems that both sources on both ends of Eurasia uh, agreed in certain points in how they described the Scythians. They were very warlike. They had all kinds of customs to show off their fearsomeness and to frighten their enemies. It seems that they brewed a special wine that was reserved only for those warriors who slew their enemies in battle. They collected scalps and skulls from their slain enemies. They made leather and garments out of their enemies' scalps. They made goblets out of their skulls. And they swore oaths to one another, right? Relationships, bonds of loyalty were extremely important, and they swore oaths by drinking uh, a mixture of blood and wine. They also apparently had great respect for women and made decisions, military diplomatic decisions, usually on the advice of the women of their tribes and clans. They used an intoxicant, which in India was referred to as soma, and they used this intoxicant for religious rites. Uh, they would use it to go into ecstasies, visionary trances, as well as war frenzy, right, preparing for battle. They had a very respected priestly class that performed elaborate rituals, especially rituals of purification. There was great concern for purifying one's bodies, one's weapons, and so on. And as for their beliefs about the world and the cosmos, it seems they believed in a certain magical or invisible power of animals. Uh, they had rituals, again, centering on animals and animal sacrifice. Uh, some of their priests could loosely be called kind of shamans who had a special relationship to animals. They had a kind of animism. They believed that all things have a spirit not only animals and people, but objects, plants, and so on. Everything is sort of imbued with spirit, and there's a sort of overarching order to the world and the cosmos, which they called Asha, which harmonized and linked together all of these kind of spiritual existences. And they believed it was a human duty. There was a sort of ethical duty to maintain this Asha, which included ensuring justice, right? Uh, retributive justice, distributive justice among people, and to fight evil. And it seems that somewhere around 1000 BC, although the date is uncertain, one particular Central Asian priest named Zoroaster had a series of visions and began to deliver prophecies and teachings. And he preached monotheism, that there is only one true God, that this God stands for good and justice as opposed to evil, that people must uh, purify themselves and commit themselves to the service of this God, and that there will be a future judgment day, a sort of final confrontation between good and evil in which people will be judged Okay, so this is certainly one of the first appearances of monotheism. So Zoroaster's teachings and his writings apparently made their way fairly quickly to Persia, to this larger urban civilization to the south, and were very popular and were eventually adopted as the state imperial religion of the Persian Empire. In Central Asia, it doesn't seem as if they caught on to that degree. Some people did embrace Zoroaster's teachings and rejected the worship of other gods and adopted his monotheistic doctrine, uh, but it never became as broadly popular and certainly never became a state religion in any Central Asian land the way it did in Persia. And it's because of Persia that these ideas and teachings went on to influence Jewish beliefs and later Christianity and Islam. Okay, so if we look at Central Asia in the time of Zoroaster, say roughly around 1000 BC, this again was an overwhelmingly nomadic society, right, with only some scattered villages and small towns, depending on trade and agriculture. But that soon started to change after 1000 BC, and some towns, especially around the area called Sogdia, sort of right smack in the middle of Central Asia, some towns began to grow. 
and to flourish. And most of them were centered around oases, right? Spots with fresh water where one could grow crops. And some of these towns came to be known as sources of, of very desirable foods, especially fruits like melons and peaches. And you'll still see that all the way to today that in Eurasia, people associate these, these towns in Central Asia with melons and, and other fruits. Some of these towns grew into sizable cities with citadels, right, with fortified palaces, dense urban centers, uh, marketplaces, really thriving marketplaces that facilitated trade and exchange of goods across the steppes, and surrounded by small farming suburbs, right? So these towns managed and benefited from trade, increasingly long distance trade uh, that was carried on by these nomads, by these mobile nomads, but that looked to the cities for their markets, right? And they began to open up greater and greater contact with surrounding civilizations, especially China. Uh, So some of the major cities that developed at this time include firstly Bukhara, which might have been the first one to grow into a large uh, metropolis. And it was founded in the 1200s BC, right? Might have started as a small village at that point, but later became a city. Uh, Samarkand in the 600s BC, and Tashkent probably in the 400s BC, right? So it was was a, a sort of gradual appearance, right? These cities, once they grew large, they were highly mercantile, uh, aristocratic, right? Very powerful uh, and prestigious uh, noble classes. Some of them wealthy, right? Uh, Wealthy even compared to other societies around them like Persia. And very cosmopolitan and polyglot, right? Because they were not based on local food production like, say, uh, you know, Jiangnan in China, but instead on trade, uh, they were very complex multilingual societies, right? And many people worked not only as merchants, but also as translators and, uh, and travelers, geographers. Uh, and really, you can think there's a kind of lasting cultural image, a kind of archetype that has been passed down in the Western imagination uh, from these these Central Asian cities. You know, if you think of like Karth and those wealthy Eastern cities that you see in Game of Thrones or Tatooine, the sort of frontier, you know, merchant trading post in Star Wars, all of them are in some way borrowing these images and associations from the Central Asian cities. And meanwhile, the nomadic people outside the cities, on the steppes and in the deserts, really reoriented a lot of their lives and activities towards the cities. Then they acted more and more as merchants, also as escorts, right, protecting and guiding traveling merchants and diplomats uh, as guards, right, guarding the cities or guarding the caravans. And the cities also became targets for the pastoral nomads to conquer. Right? And this seems to have happened many times that mobile you know, fighters would simply show up for no reason or maybe they'd have a pretext, some grievance, and they would attack a city, find a weakness, charge in, uh, take over, and install a new ruling dynasty or a new ruling aristocracy. And some people have sometimes said, well, there's a cycle here that kind of defines Central Asia, where you have a settled city, nomadic people come and conquer, then they settle down, they become the settled urban people, and then another group shows up and conquers them, and you get this kind of repeating cycle. And the truth is that did happen, at least now and then, but, you know, it's not that simple. (laughs) It wasn't always this clear repeating cycle. You know, sometimes the the nomadic people would come in, then they would leave for some reason, or there would be a rebellion, they'd get overthrown. It it went in all kinds of different directions. It wasn't this simple repeating pattern, right? Another frequent pattern that probably is more consistent than that is that nomadic people wanted to control the wealth and the splendor and the prestige of the cities. And in order to do that, they took on advisors, right? And there was this frequent kind of partnership and alliance between 
nomadic warlords and highly trained, knowledgeable urbanites who knew the languages, who knew the geography, who knew how to collect taxes, and would act as kind of grand vizier type officials for the warlords who very often didn't even live in the cities, who just wanted tribute, but who lived in their encampments outside the cities. Okay, so this is the basic sort of terrain we can see of of the Indo-Iranian uh, Central Asian world in, say, up till about 500 BC, right, roughly. After that point, Central Asia got pulled into imperial politics, right? M- new empires showed up and began trying with various degrees of success to conquer and annex Central Asia into a bigger global imperial world. So the first person to try to do this was the Emperor Cyrus of Persia, who was really the main founder of the Persian Empire. And he invaded and, you know, managed to seize control briefly over some of the cities uh, north of the Oxus River, right? So uh, this area I've been calling Sogdia is also sometimes just called Transoxiana, right? Which is actually the Greek word for the lands beyond the Oxus River. And So he invaded and briefly occupied a bit, but then was defeated, killed, and beheaded by the Scythian queen Tomiris, right? So it wasn't the cities, but the the nomads who defeated him. And reportedly, uh, after uh, defeating and killing Cyrus, Tomiris severed his head and put it in a sack filled with blood and declared, now the bloodthirsty conqueror can have his fill, right? Uh, So again, you know, this kind of dramatic ritualized violence as a demonstration of of power and courage. Now later Darius I of Persia, a successor of Cyrus, was able to conquer most of Bactria and Sogdia and install uh, rulers called satraps in those cities, but he was still not able to conquer the Scythians. Okay, so Bactria and Sogdia were managed kind of indirectly as autonomous provinces uh, or satrapies within the empire. And that was the first time that some sort of larger imperial rule was imposed, however weakly, on these cities. Later, another successor, uh, Darius III, was attacked and defeated quite suddenly by Alexander the Great. Right, So in the 300s, BC, Alexander charges in, defeats the emperor, forces him to abandon and flee from the capital of Persepolis. Uh, Darius fled up into the satrapy of Bactria, seeking protection, and the Bactrian satrap named Bessus simply killed him uh, and tried to usurp his throne and assume rule over the empire and fight back against Alexander. But Alexander simply uh, continued, uh, pursued Bessus into Central Asia, defeated him, seized control of these provinces, and not long after, he married a Sogdian princess named Roxana as a way of trying to solidify his political control over the Central Asian cities. Uh, On his way, as he moved his forces into Central Asia, he founded several Alexandrias, right? New military cities named after himself. And several of them are still there in some form, including uh, Kandahar, right? So the city of Kandahar in Afghanistan, you may have heard of, was originally Alexandria, right? Now, Alexander, you may uh, know, was forced by his troops to stop his conquests and turn back to uh, to Babylon in Mesopotamia, and he died there, probably of pleurisy, not long after returning to, to Babylon. And after he died, his empire quickly broke up, and his various lieutenants uh, fell to fighting one another over who's the successor and over territory. And so some of his governors that he'd installed in Bactria uh, broke away and formed their own kingdom, which we call the Greco-Bactrian kingdom. 
right? So it has united together some of these Central Asian cities, uh, but its rulers and its elite are largely Greek, and the main shared language is Greek. Uh, so this Br Greco-Bactrian uh, kingdom lasted for several centuries. It controlled a large chunk of Central Asia, especially the whole southern band, and it adopted Buddhism, right? The leaders uh, learned of Buddhism from priests from India, and they sponsored a sort of tradition of Greco-Buddhist Hellenistic art. And you can see great sculptures, for example, depictions of the Buddha in a kind of classical Greek style. But this kingdom eventually ended uh, in collapse. It was overrun by invaders and collapsed probably in 128 BC, leading to a period of chaos and fragmentation. Now, why did this Greco-Bactrian kingdom collapse? Well, it seems that that was the result of a sort of destabilizing chain reaction that started much earlier, decades earlier, with China. So the chain reaction began from China. So China, under a series of very strong and effective emperors of the Qin and Han dynasties, became uh, more effectively unified and asserted its control more directly over a large portion of East Asia, and it began to expand northward, sort of beyond the central homeland of Han China, into the steppes and the deserts north in the areas that are now Mongolia and Siberia. And they also began to secure more of this northern frontier with walls, right? The beginnings of what we now think of as the Great Wall. Well, these assertions by China upset and disturbed nomadic peoples to the north. And around this time, or maybe earlier, these nomadic peoples formed a confederation, which the Chinese referred to as the Xiongnu. That's how they word it in their writings, okay? And these Xiongnu people rallied together around a new leader and began to counterattack aggressively against China. So this forced China basically to come to terms with these Xiongnu, who were, you know, a very formidable new force on the scene. And for a time, they actually recognized the Xiongnu ruler as an equal. So they sometimes sent tributes to the Xiongnu and royal brides to marry into the Xiongnu ruling clan. And China agreed to divide their dominions between settled farming lands, which they claimed under their direct control, and nomadic lands, which they left under Xiongnu control. And it seems that they agreed to this deal, which was generous in a way to the Xiongnu, in the hopes that over time they would civilize them or cook them in the, the Chinese uh, terminology, that they would uh, convert them to Chinese-style civilization. But after a while, under the Han, China developed better strategies and learned better how to fight more effectively against the Xiongnu and began to move more aggressively against them. And in response, the Xiongnu moved westward and southwestward out of their original homelands down into Xinjiang, right, into those western frontier areas west of China. And in doing so, they pushed out, they attacked and pushed out a lot of the local peoples who were already there, particularly the Yuaji. And the Yuaji and others moved then in a kind of, you know, chain reaction, also moved westward out onto the steppes and eventually started attacking and overrunning the Greco-Bactrian kingdom, right? And this is what eventually weakened and destroyed that kingdom. Now, China, again, they had learned much better how to counter the power of the nomadic steppe peoples, and so they continued attacking the Xiongnu in Xinjiang, pushing them further west. And so the Xiongnu continued and went uh, further west as well, and eventually seized control of most of those cities and towns in Sogdia and Bactria and demanded tribute and labor from them, right? So they subjugated most of that core area. Now, as the Xiongnu took control of this region, they again kind of came to terms with China, right? And agreed to coexist with them, and China considered this an acceptable agreement now that the Xiongnu had been driven so far to the west. And so very soon, the Han 
opened up trade right, and, and agreed to trade more freely with the steppe peoples and particularly uh, in 130 BC, lifted the restrictions on trades to the West. And this is, strictly speaking, this is what scholars point to as the beginning of the first Silk Road, right? Now that China, this massive market and massive supplier of luxury goods, was willing to trade freely to the West, the, these Central Asian cities that had always been trading cities got an enormous boost and suddenly could manage very long distance trades safely across long routes, connecting all the way from China to the Middle East and even eventually to Europe. These, these cities really became something more like what we think of them today, these sort of fabulous entrepots of goods moving east and west across the steppes and the deserts. Now, even as they were experiencing this prosperity, divisions began to emerge among the Xiongnu, right? Particularly which city would have the upper hand in trade, what policy should they take towards China or Persia. And the Chinese, when they had conflicts and skirmishes with the Chinese, the Chinese now tended to win. They had gained the upper hand. And so this creates a lot of recriminations, a lot of fear among the Xiongnu. And they start to divide into feuding factions. And the main southern group of Xiongnu helped to create a new so-called Kushan Empire, basically around the same territory that was the Greco-Bactrian kingdom, and that in a lot of ways resembled the Greco-Bactrian kingdom, and was able to last fairly long, right? So, so they become the sort of major power in Bactria and southward into what we now think of as Afghanistan, right? Meanwhile, the northern group basically loses out. They're, you know, they don't get control over the trade routes. They, they lose this power struggle. And they start to gradually dissolve, but also move westward and northwestward through what's now Kazakhstan and into Russia. And in that area, they sort of gathered new followers, created a new confederation, and regrouped, okay, and set their sights on, on the west, right, on areas where there were other towns and cities with wealth to the west. And... By the 200s AD, they start pressing over into Europe, attacking uh, Slavic and especially Germanic peoples in Europe who then flee into the Roman Empire. Right? So they, they start to trigger this massive Germanic migration of peoples down across the Roman borders that, that weakens and strains the Roman Empire. And then in the 300s, they begin to invade and raid directly into Roman territory. And so this group that had broken away is what we now call the Huns, right? So apparently their name had become something like Hunna uh, or Huna. And they start to very aggressively and brutally uh, invade and raid Roman towns and cities. And for a long time, this story was controversial. You know, there were scholars who looked at the Chinese records about the Xiongnu and said, well, those same people must have moved westward, and they're the same people who then were the Huns that attacked Rome. Uh, others objected to this and said, no, there's, there's no clear connection, and they're quite different. Uh, it's just a coincidence. But now, currently, scholars think, well, there is some connection. But it's a matter, again, of these sort of schools of people assembling, disassembling, changing. Uh, there's a sort of ship of Theseus problem, right, of like, when do they become a different group? Uh, but probably the name Hun is related, right, and derived from the same root. So the Huns attack and raid in the Roman Empire. And as you may know, their sort of reign of terror culminates with Attila the Hun, who was especially aggressive and vicious, but who then died suddenly of a nosebleed at his own wedding feast in 453. Uh, so it seems pretty likely that uh, he was poisoned, right? Somebody saw him as too much of a danger. Maybe his new wife didn't want to live with him, and he was poisoned and killed in 453. And after that point, the Huns basically just melt away. They sort of break up and dissolve into the background, just as groups did repeatedly in Central Asia. Okay, so after the, uh, you know, the breaking apart of the Xiongnu dominion 
in Central Asia, you get a kind of second interregnum and time of fragmentation and, and chaos. And it's at this time that another group appears really more quickly and more aggressively out of the same area that the Xiongnu came from, probably that sort of far eastern corner of Mongolia, the sort of border of Mongolia and Siberia, and rush into Central Asia very rapidly, just at the time when the Kushan Empire is collapsing. And this is the Turkic group, okay? So so there, or you could more broadly say Turco-Mongolic peoples, right, came in and took advantage of the power vacuum as the Kushan Empire was breaking up. And they create a whole complicated regional patchwork of small states. And they take over and subjugate much of Central Asia, including Xinjiang, and large sections of northern China as well, are attacked and conquered by these Turco-Mongolic peoples. Once they've secured control of Xinjiang and some surrounding areas, they actually are the first to bring Buddhism northward into Central Asia and China. And many of them uh, adopt Buddhism and encourage missionaries, sponsor the building of temples and stupas and so on to spread Buddhism. But in addition to that, they also provide shelter and encouragement for other religions as well. So towns and cities under Turkic control also introduce Manichaeism, which is a sort of dualistic religion, somewhat like Zoroastrianism from Persia, Christianity, right, especially Nestorian Christianity, and many other faiths, right? And so under Turkic control, there's sort of enough safe travel and communication that all of these faiths and, and new doctrines spread, and it becomes a, a really rich, multi-religious world. Eventually, particular Turkic groups uh, come to the fore and assert dominance and form the first really expansive empire controlling much of Central Asia. So in the 500s, a particular Turkic group comes out of their homeland in Mongolia, and this group has a stronger ruler with tremendous status and power, who is called the Khagan, okay? And the origins of that word are unclear, but it might mean Khan of Khans, or sort of ruler of rulers. And the Khagan was considered a kind of divine figure, and he was called Heaven Conceived, and he was considered to be linked to Tengri, which is the ancient word for the sky god or personification of the sky or the heavens. So he was a sort of quasi-shamanic figure, and the Khagans were considered to derive their legitimacy from their control over certain sacred lands. Okay, There were what they considered a kind of holy land along the Orkhon River in Mongolia, and they had certain special powers and privileges, like control over a sacred herd of deer that no one else was allowed to access. And sort of with this greater authority and prestige around the Khagan, this group of Turks in the 500s was able to quickly conquer westward and consolidate a large, powerful empire. And they took territory from these these other groups that had been there earlier, and also from Persia, which had retaken some lands down around Bactria in that area. So the Turks consolidate this massive territory and then continue westward and eventually confront and sort of harass the Byzantines in in what's now Turkey, right? We, we call it Turkey because it was eventually conquered by the Turks. So they really create the first massive continental empire really linking all the way from China to Europe, right? From, from East Asia to the Black Sea. They take control naturally over the the cities in Transoxiana, right, including Bukhara, Shash, Samarkand, Kucha, and Khotan. And these cities had formed kind of loose, shifting confederations, right, uh, to ally together and try to protect their trade routes and so on, much like the nomadic tribes did. Uh, but they were eventually uh, forced to recognize the Turks as their overlords and pay tribute. And in return, they grew and were able to benefit from a renewed Silk Road trade, right? So there was a sort of second flourishing of the Silk Road. 
The cities were visited often by Chinese travelers and diplomats. And so we have information about them, especially from these Chinese writers. Uh, they were they had massive markets supplying all kinds of foods, spices, cloth, precious stones like jade. They were connected mainly by camel caravans that traveled along the caravan routes. And the caravans were supported by so-called caravanserai, which are sort of fortified inns or hostels placed along the routes on the steppes and in the deserts. And they were usually square, uh, organized around a central courtyard, which was defensible. And they were places for rest, resupplying of you know food and water, animals, security, right, for protecting the valuable goods that you were transporting, and also for worship, right? You people could uh, go to uh, Christian or Buddhist shrines and worship at these caravanserai. So the Transoxianian cities were, again, multi-religious, Buddhist, Zoroastrian, Nestorian Christian, as well as worshiping local gods, uh, temples to animal figures. Uh, they were multilingual. People in the cities more and more began to learn multiple languages and multiple writing systems. Right? So whereas it, 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 writing had come in from outside areas like, like China and Persia. And by this time, by the Turkish era, there are inscriptions and documents being created there in Chinese, Tibetan, Turkic, Tokharian, Indic, Greek, Armenian, and Iranian. They were multi-class societies, right? They had an upper class of nobles, which went back to ancient times. Also merchants, uh, castes of merchants, which could often be just as powerful and wealthy as the nobles, and commoners, which included peasant farmers and laborers. The Turkic Empire, if we sort of zoom back out and look at this extensive empire, the Turkic Empire did not have a fixed capital, right? It did not adopt any of those merchant cities as a capital, but rather the Turkic capital was a, you could say, a kind of mobile city. It was a moving encampment of tents, mostly heavy canvas tents called yurts, that housed the ruler and his main administrators and his army, and that could move seasonally or that could move with military campaigns. And these encampments were called Ordu. The center of power basically was the royal or imperial Ordu, right, the Ordu of the Kagan. And our English word horde comes from that Turkic word Ordu, uh, you know, but it didn't just mean a big, you know, massive pile of warriors. It meant this, this encampment that was the center of authority. There was a tremendous struggle to manage this huge empire, right? It was very difficult, you know, even a, across the steppes. Travel could be time-consuming and dangerous, and it was very hard to manage. So, the empire began gradually to break into two parts in order to better uh, sort of manage affairs and protect borders, right? But even as it took that step, much like the Roman Empire, not long before this, the Roman Empire also split into eastern and western halves, but it still continued to weaken, right? That didn't fully solve the administrative problems. And there was a lot of controversy, it seems, within the Turkic imperial court over what sort of empire it should be. And there was controversy between those who wanted to settle down, build towns, build temples, and become more like, say, China or India, and those who opposed this and who argued that the strength of the Turkic Empire was in its nomadism, in its mobility, right? And so there was a sort of push and pull between these different parties, and it seems that the pro-nomadic party basically won out. Uh, eventually, because they were increasingly losing battles with opponents, including China, they eventually accepted and recognized the overlordship of the Tang Dynasty in China. Okay, So China took advantage of this, of their sort of upper hand over the Turks, 
and began sending in their own administrators and governors and started to loosely and indirectly rule most of the Turkish territory, okay? And they eventually, for briefly, the Tang Dynasty took over a massive expanse going as far west as Bactria. Uh, and they started to learn about and even admire the Central Asian peoples and their art and their lifestyle. And there were fashions in China for Central Asian music and dance and art and fabrics like Turkish rugs and tapestries. Uh, eventually, the Turks turned against this and, uh, you know, believed that the, the Chinese had pushed too far and overstepped their authority. So the Turks began to rebel and to try to reestablish their empire, especially in the West. So they sort of pushed back against the Chinese and had for a little while a kind of Indian summer of of Turkish flourishing. But it didn't last for very long and they were weakened again and challenged especially by two new important forces to the east and to the west. So firstly to the east the new power on the scene that uh, that undermined the Turkish Empire was the Uyghurs. Right? So the Uyghurs were another sort of Turco-Mongolic group Probably a lot of them had already been Turks, but sort of broke away and formed their own group. And they rose to power in the 700s and 800s and seized control of much of northern China and Mongolia. They adopted Manichaeism. So that became the sort of first official state religion of a Central Asian state was Manichaeism. It's unclear why. Uh, and they built a massive walled capital city called Ordu Balik right on the Orkhon River, that sort of sacred river in Mongolia. So Ordu Balik was really the first proper imperial capital city in Central Asia. But then eventually they suffered another collapse. There were struggles over control of the throne between different families. They were constantly being undermined and interfered with, especially by China. And so the Uyghur Empire eventually broke up and new aggressive groups like Kyrgyz and Khitans kind of pounced and took advantage and destroyed what was left of the Uyghur kingdom in 840. But still small Uyghur states and outposts remained and hung on over to the west in what's now Xinjiang, right, and remained independent. And still to this day, people in Xinjiang mostly consider themselves Uyghur, right? That's where they've persisted. The other new major power to the West that began attacking the Turks was the Arabs, right? The new Muslim Arab Empire. So Muslim Arabs began raiding and invading northward from Persia across the Hindu Kush mountains and into Central Asia, starting in the early 700s. So this is the sort of new far frontier of the Muslim, uh, of the Muslim Caliphate, just as at the same time that they were crossing over into Spain, over in Europe, uh, they started attacking into Central Asia. They weakened and beat back the Turks and began capturing some of those wealthy Silk Road cities. And this culminated most importantly with the siege and surrender of Samarkand in 712. So Samarkand was by this time the biggest, most prosperous, most important city on the Silk Road. And they, uh, they, the Arabs took it in 712, right, just one year after the Moorish invasion of Spain. They then uh, defeated a major Turkish army that tried to take back the city in 713. And so their advance was so quick and so effective that China actually became concerned. And there was a confrontation between China and the Arabs. And so China sent out uh, armies, became involved, trying to hold off the Arab advance. But the Arabs defeated the Chinese in a massive battle in 751. So at this point, the Muslim Arabs take control of basically all the Silk Road cities and install themselves as a small ruling elite. Right. So Islam at this point, in most of the lands that the Muslims conquer, they simply install themselves as a small ruling governing elite. They do not forcibly convert people, and they don't make a lot of effort to convert people. But gradually over time, Islam starts to kind of trickle out, right? People for political advantage or for whatever reason convert over time, and you get a, a Muslim presence in Central Asia. So 
This Arab control doesn't last for very long either. And instead, again, this empire falls apart and you get a sort of post-imperial Turkish era, right? So the Turkish empire now is gone, it's broken up, but various Turkic people still have power. Turkish is the main shared language, customs, uh, traditions are largely Turkish, right? So you have a post-imperial Turkish era. New tribes form and take small territories like the Kyrgyz I mentioned, the Khitan, Karluks, and others. Some Turks, especially poorer Turks who aren't competing well in this new environment, actually settle and become agrarians. So sort of farming towns and villages grow, but they're largely Turkish. And there's a gradual spreading of the Turkish language and customs, a sort of Turkification of these various other peoples, you know, whether it was the older Indo-Iranians or Arabs, people become increasingly Turkified, okay? And there's a slow, uneven Islamification as well. Islam gradually spreads through different social classes and spreads out from the cities into the countryside. It's carried initially by merchants, but then also increasingly by Sufi mystics. Okay, so I've mentioned the Sufis when I talked about Islam, right? They're sort of mystical teachers of a sort of transcendental philosophy and of meditative practices. And many of the Sufis that travel around Central Asia at this time are also diviners, prophets, they do divination, they use music and dance to go into trances. And in a lot of ways, they really resemble the older Central Asian shamans, these sort of Turkic and Mongolic shaman people who believe they have communication with the spirit world and the world of the dead. And the Sufi missionaries are also, they can easily connect the Abrahamic God in which they believe to Tengri, to the older sort of God of the sky or heaven that was widely believed in by Turks, right? So it, this sort of facilitates a lot of conversion. As Islam spreads, meanwhile, the Islamic empire centered in Damascus and then in Baghdad, the Umayyad and Abbasid uh, caliphate continues, right? And persists as a major power down to the south, right? So this is now one of their big neighbors that Central Asian people are aware of down to the south is the Islamic caliphate. and this caliphate has enormous demand for laborers and fighters, right? They want people. And they encourage the Muslim Turks, you know, increasingly more Turks are converting to Islam, and the caliphs encourage these Turks to attack and fight against their pagan or heretical neighbors, right? People who, who either reject Islam or who... Uh, who have adopted Islam but combined it with other mystical shamanic traditions and who can, who other Muslims regard as heretics. And they encourage these wars both as a means of spreading Islam and also as a means of getting people, right? Taking prisoners who can then be trafficked back to Baghdad as slaves, right? Or, or as forced soldiers and mercenaries, right? So, so there is increasingly a traffic in people, a sort of slave trade and prisoner trade southward from Central Asia into the Islamic world. And many of these prisoners from Central Asia then are used as soldiers and guards and also as administrators. And some of them actually move up into high positions, become generals, ministers, viziers, and it's strangely enough, some of them, even as they're still technically legally slaves, are actually running these Islamic states and empires. So you can see people uh, like, for example, the Mamluks, which was the Central Asian slave army that actually overthrew the government and took control of Egypt, right, and became a long-lasting powerful government in Egypt. And there are certain individuals like Al-Khwarazmi, uh, who was a mathematician and scholar from Khwarazm in Central Asia, who was taken as a slave into Persia and became a scholar and teacher and the inventor of algebra, <laughs> right? So it was one of these Central Asian captives who became a sort of major leading intellectual light of the Islamic world, okay? So at this time in the 800s, 900s, 1000s, in this post-imperial era, you have a combination of the mostly east-west Silk Road with the north-south slave trade, okay? And 
these two trades together really enrich a few groups and a few cities that are able to sort of uh, occupy crossroads and insert themselves into both trades. And so some of these large groups that create new, powerful, expansive Silk Road empires include the Samanids and the Karakhanids. So, so the Samanids and Karakhanids basically take control of, of Sogdia and Bactria and those sort of traditional core areas that had been part of, of the Kushan Empire. But probably the most important and influential are the Khazars. So the Khazars are another Turkic group that had broken away from the Western Turkish Empire much earlier, back in the 600s, but that then gradually grew more powerful and moved northwestward, sort of up into what's now Siberia, European Russia, Ukraine, took control of a very large area, right? And began to manage the sort of western outlet of the Silk Road, where these Asian goods were moved into Europe, right? And trafficked to Kiev and the Slavic uh, kingdom at Kiev, and also to the Black Sea and over the Black Sea to Constantinople and the Byzantine Empire. So by 750, uh, the Khazars had become a major power in what's now Russia and Siberia and the Caucasus. They were ruled by their own Khagan, right? That was their traditional Turkish title for their ruler, who was seen as a priestly, holy figure connected to Tengri. And they built an imperial capital at Atil on the Volga River, right? So, so Atil was sort of the next a great uh, Central Asian imperial capital after Ordubalik in Mongolia. And Atil, according to travelers and diplomats who went there, Atil was cosmopolitan. It was a multi-faith city and a multi-faith government. It had Islamic uh, administrators and people of other faiths. Diplomatically and politically, it was usually aligned with the Byzantines, uh, and they even sometimes intermarried their own uh, members into the Byzantine imperial family. Now, allegedly, according to several sources from later years, from sort of around 1000, uh, the Khagan, the ruler, converted around the year 800 to Judaism. And this is a fairly consistent claim we see in several independent sources that the Khagan and the upper class of the Khazars converted and became Jews. Uh, some scholars have disputed the authenticity of this claim, but, you know, it's sort of weird why would these various sources say this if it wasn't true. Uh, it's possible that it did happen, although there is no archaeological evidence confirming it from Khazaria itself. And the capital has just recently been excavated, but there's no corroborating evidence to back this up. But if it's true, it may be that the Khazars saw themselves as kind of caught in a difficult bind between the Islamic empires to the east, whom they wanted to trade with and have diplomatic relations with, and the Christian Byzantines whom they also had a close alliance with, and that possibly converting to Judaism was a way to be seen as kind of legitimate, not as pagans, but as something at least legitimate and understandable, but without being aligned with either the Muslims or the Christians. Now, the Khazar Empire was later weakened as the Byzantines eventually turned against them and sent enemies sort of northward across the steppes to attack them. And the empire gradually shrank, and eventually Atil was overrun and destroyed in the 960s. So as the Khazars fell apart and a new kind of power vacuum formed, another group, yet another Turkish group, emerged and sort of reasserted Turkish power across much of Central Asia, and that was the Seljuk Turks. So after about 1,000, the Seljuks regrouped, retook control of much of what had been Turkish territory, and become known as a very formidable army, much more powerful than anything that the caliphate at this point can muster. So the caliphs in Baghdad actually invited Seljuk Turks to send an army to Baghdad to act as protectors of the caliphs. And they began simply seizing more territory further west through the Middle East and into Europe. 
and they defeated the Byzantines in 1071 at the Battle of Manzikert and seized control of much of Asia Minor, so a lot of what's now Turkey. Uh, and this is part of what then eventually provoked the Crusades, as it really alarmed Christian Europe. Other Turkish states, like the Samanids and the Karakhanids, uh, persisted through these years, but gradually declined and weakened, fell to infighting, and were also taken over. A lot of their territory was taken by the Seljuk Turks. So by 1100 or so, the Seljuk Turks are clearly kind of the main power uh, in the region. Okay, so finally, uh, if the Seljuk Turks were doing so well, what happened to them? Why did they not remain as the main empire? Well, finally, another new group that was not Turkic but was distantly related to Turks also emerged from that area far to the east, north of China, up in what's now Mongolia and Siberia. And that was the Mongols, right? That's why we call it Mongolia. So the Mongols were, it seems, originally a loose grouping of distantly related tribes around that area, the sort of far northern, northeastern corner of the steppes and the Siberian forests. And they were often fighting against their rivals, the Tatars, right? So they were, there was this sort of long blood rivalry of Mongols and Tatars. And they began, in the early 1100s, they began to organize and try to form a tighter alliance in order to face off more effectively against both the Tatars and China. So a particular Mongol man named Timujin was born in 1162, and he grew up in a fairly poor and politically weak clan in sort of in the mix there among these Mongols. Uh, and he didn't have a lot of prospects, you know, he didn't have any connections to major chieftains. Uh, his father died when he was fairly young. But he would go out on adventures, sort of, you know, raiding adventures like you do, with, with his brothers and eventually with friends and followers. And he distinguished himself by his talent uh, in fighting and his strategic talent and, all, and by his charisma. And so he gathered a larger band of followers, fellow adventurers, and some of them, it seems, swore oaths to one another and became blood brothers, which is a very important relationship, you know, like family among Mongols. And he was able to take his sort of growing band of followers and successfully defeat the Tatars, right, win a decisive victory against the Tatars. And after that victory, his Mongol supporters declared him Genghis Khan, right? They gave him this title of Genghis Khan or Chinggis Khan, which probably meant universal emperor. So his army only grew further very quickly and became a multi-tribal army, right, that held personal loyalty to Temujin himself, right? Rather than being organized along clan and familial lines, it was about personal commitment to Genghis Khan as a leader. And they rapidly invaded westward and quickly steamrolled over all sorts of opponents, right? Including various Turkic groups. Most of them just submitted immediately, right? Rather than have to face off against Genghis Khan. They simply immediately surrendered. He defeated the Uyghurs, okay, the, these sort of confederations of Uyghurs over in Xinjiang. And he was able to then use these Uyghurs as administrators, right, as diplomats and tax collectors, right? He formed this important alliance, as so many Central Asian rulers had done before, right? He was a nomad. He needed these settled, educated, literate people to run this new empire. And for him, that was Uyghurs. Uh, and they also acted as conduits, you know, introducing him, giving him knowledge uh, and communicating with the settled urban world. So with their help, he captured Samarkand, that major city, in 1220. And because Samarkand had resisted, he massacred thousands of people and enslaved those who were skilled, like skilled artisans or scribes. He enslaved them and used them as labor for his army, right? And this became the pattern for Genghis Khan, that he, he could accept peace, peaceable surrenders, but when he met resistance, he would act with great brutality, right, to, to crush opposition and impose control. Okay, so within a few years after 1220, he has now basically conquered everything that had been the 
older Turkish empire, right? He's, he again has this massive empire stretching from Siberia and Mongolia and sh through Xinjiang and Sogdia and all the way over to the Caspian, right? He's an incredible uh, sort of juggernaut of power. And like the Turks before him, he finds it's very difficult to administer this empire. And so he starts to divide it among his sons, okay? And in each son or grandson acts as a kind of local governor, right? And each sort of sphere or zone of the empire is called an ulus, okay? So these sons, each of whom has his own ulus as a base of power, then also sets out further in all different directions, okay? And some go down and conquer Iran, okay, or Persia to the southwest. Russia is conquered to the northwest. Uh, and some Mongol armies even go beyond Russia and invade Poland and Hungary for a brief time, okay? In 1258, a Mongol army invaded southward into the Islamic Empire and captured and destroyed Baghdad. Okay, so this is, this is the end of that Abbasid Golden Age, right? The Mongol destruction of Baghdad. In 1260, they continued westward through the Middle East and eventually uh, invaded into what's now sort of Syria and Lebanon and were finally stopped at Ayn Jalut and were defeated by a Mamluk army led by a commander named Baibars, who was born in Central Asia, basically in what's now Kazakhstan, and then had become a captive and uh, a Mamluk fighter and the ruler of Egypt. So, so it, it took a Central Asian <laughs> leader like Baibars to finally stop the Mongols. Okay. So the empire was divided into these several ulus, and over time, especially after Genghis Khan died, it became increasingly fragmented, right? This is what happens over and over. It was still technically one empire and with one with one leader, with one Khan, but really the different Uluses were like different separate kingdoms and they started to compete with one another. They stopped cooperating. The most important and most powerful Ulus of them all was certainly China, right? So the Mongols early on had conquered the sort of northern edge of China from its Turkic rulers. And eventually the grandson of Genghis Khan called Kublai Khan became the ruler of that Ulus and he then successfully invaded southward and conquered the rest of China. Okay, and he becomes the major power controlling much of East Asia. Uh, he has a very rich, splendorous court blending Mongol and Chinese art and customs. Uh, this is the court that was supposedly visited by Marco Polo, right? If it, if if Marco Polo was telling the truth that he really traveled all the way to China. He reported receiving an audience with Kublai Khan and seeing the beautiful art and the, the perfumes and the food of this beautiful court. Kublai Khan also completed the conquest of Korea and he launched failed attempts at invading Japan, Vietnam, and Indonesia, right? In Indonesia, he sort of briefly uh, conquered and occupied Java before being evicted uh, by the local people. So between about 1250 and 1350, you have a sort of Mongol golden age where the empire is the biggest land empire that's ever existed. And it was extremely rich. It facilitated extensive trade, contact, uh, exchange of knowledge, beliefs, ideas. Trade was extremely lucrative, especially for sort of multilingual cosmopolitan people, right? The Mongols helped create this kind of new class of widely traveled, sophisticated merchants and officials and writers and artists. Uh, there was tremendous cultural exchange. You know, at the height of the Mongol Empire, people were learning and cooking Chinese cuisine in Iran. They were, there was an orchestra at the imperial court in China that had all kinds of Western instruments, including a Western-style pipe organ. Uh, there was just a huge flowering of art, cloth, embroidery, music, dance, uh, new sports like, uh, you know, polo. This is when polo became a really international game and spread all over the Mongol Empire, even as far west as the Mediterranean. Wrestling, uh, the Mongols sponsored international championship tournaments in polo and wrestling. 
But the Mongols themselves, after they spread out among this huge empire, they mostly assimilated to their subject peoples, right? The Mongol language really wasn't adopted, although some people did learn it and there were dictionaries. Uh, it didn't really spread, and rather Mongols adopted mostly Turkish, right? And they intermixed with Turkic peoples. A uh, Turkish spread, so rather than Mongolifying most of the empire, instead it continued to Turkify, right? And Mongol and Turk Turkic peoples intermarried, intermingled, and. If you read Western European sources talking about the East at this time, they talk about these people as Tatars, which is really a misnomer, right? They weren't mostly Tatars, but that was sort of their catch-all word for this blended sort of Mongol-Turkic, Turco-Mongolic people that ruled this empire. And the local differences grew over time, right? The, the ruling peoples in the different Uluses became more different as they adopted local ideas, practices, traditions, right? And this probably only furthered the rivalry, the division, the refusal to cooperate among the different branches of the empire as they saw each other as increasingly foreign, right? And more and more, many of them began to sponsor assassinations, right? Poisonings of one another's leaders to try to weaken one another. And eventually they all uh, became unstable and sort of broke into minor regional states, right? So the Mongol heyday didn't last all that long, right? It, it didn't last, it, it, it did last for several generations, but it was not as persistent as Egypt or even Rome. It's important to know about the success of the Mongols, partly because of the sort of contradictory signals you can get from it when you, when you read about the Mongol Empire, that it was so admired and so splendorous and it was, there was such a renaissance of art and it was so cosmopolitan at the same time that it was extremely violent, right? That these were people who had no compunction about mass slaughter, who uh, would, you know, assassinate <laughs> their enemies as well as their allies and was you know just as brutal as any power there's ever been it sort of illustrates that uh, cosmopolitanism and appreciation of aesthetics does not necessarily mean that one is peaceful or just or tolerant right though this is kind of a deceptive concept right embracing difference doesn't necessarily really mean treating people in a humane way. And the Mongol Empire maybe is the sort of greatest example of, on the one hand, celebrating and enriching the traditions of different peoples, while n having no compunction about brutally murdering them <laughs> at the same time, right? So that's the point where I'll leave off, is what happened after this sort of greatest Central Asian Empire, the Mongols, broke apart, right? Who came into the power vacuum and how did uh, how did Central Asia continue to transform into more like what we see in the modern world today? Uh, and how did they continue to have an impact in different ways on all these different societies, on Russia and China and India and the Middle East? So I hope you enjoyed it, and I should have the next part soon. Thank you. Thank you.